Hello and welcome to lesson 3.9 part 2 or if we are in geometry it's the 8.1 section. Today we're going to look at the Pythagorean theorem and its identity. So when we're dealing with the Pythagorean theorem we have something called a Pythagorean triple and the Pythagorean triple okay is a set and I apologize that is an S it's a set of non-zero whole numbers, a, b, and c, that satisfy the equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if we look at an example, okay, a Pythagorean triple might be something like three, four, and five. And that's because three squared plus four squared equals five squared. Another example of a Pythagorean triple would be eight, 15 and 17. Okay, now these are just two examples, but I did want to show you that if you take any of these numbers or any of these number sets, so let's take this set right here. If you take these and you multiply them all by the same thing, so let's say I take 3, 4, 5, and I multiply everything by 3. Okay, so this is going to give me 9, 12, and 15. These two are also Pythagorean triples, okay? So as long as you're multiplying all three numbers by the same um, constant or the same whole number, then that new set of data will create a Pythagorean triple as well. Now, sometimes we get numbers um, when we're taking square roots that are not perfect squares, but we have to keep them in a radical form, okay? Because that a radical form is more exact. So what we can do is we can sometimes break those numbers underneath the radical down into perfect squares and we can simplify the radical is what, we're, what we say. So how we're going to do this is if I look at the first example here, the square root of 50, um, when I think about my perfect squares, I know that 50 is really 25 times 2 and 25 is a perfect square. So when I multiply underneath the radical, I can actually break my radical up. So I can break that product of 25 times 2 because remember this here gives me 50. This becomes the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. Well now what I can do is I can simplify this radical here. The square root of 25 is really 5. I'm multiplying right here and then I have the square root of 2. Well I can't simplify the square root of 2 anymore. So I'm just going to say that that would be five square roots of two. And this is now a simplified version of the square root of 50. Likewise, for the square root of 48, uh, the square root of 48, I can break down into the square root of 16 times three. Okay, because, and again, I can break this down into two and 24. So I could break this down into 2 and 24, but 2 and 24, neither one of those are, those are perfect squares. So I went with 16 and 3 because 16 is a perfect square. So now I can break this down into the 16, or square root of 16 times the square root of 3. Well, because the square root of 16 can be simplified, that can become 4. And then the square root of 3, I can't simplify that anymore, so this then becomes my final answer. So now when I look at example 5, Example 5 says to find the value of x and to leave our answer in the simplest radical form. So here I have a leg and a leg. So ultimately I have x squared plus 8 squared equals the length of my hypotenuse or 20 squared. So when I simplify this, I have x squared plus 64 equals 400 or x squared equals 336. And again, what I want to do is I need to get x by itself. So to do that, I square root both sides to undo the squaring function, and I'm left with x equals the square root of 336. So now 336, I can break this down into perfect squares. Now this will take a little bit of practice, okay? So if I were you, I would start out by saying, is 336 divisible by 4? Is it divisible by 9, 16, and so on? So by doing a little bit of trial and error, I was able to figure out that 336 is really 16 times 21. So now when I break this down, I have the square root of 16 
times the square root of 21, which is going to give me four square roots of 21. So my, when my, I get my final answer, I always wanna make sure that the stuff that's left under the radical is not divisible by any other perfect squares. And in this case, 21 is not divisible by a perfect square, so we leave it simplified like this. Now when we're dealing with um, the Pythagorean theorem, we also have something called the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. So the converse, okay, this is going to switch what we call the hypothesis and the conclusion. So when we have an if-then statement, this is what we call a conditional. So we have the example here that says if an animal is a horse, so I have if the animal is a horse, then it has four legs. Okay, so we have the hypothesis, which is the first part or the followed by the if or it follows the if so the hypothesis here would be um, the animal is a horse so here's my hypothesis then we have the conclusion part which is the it has four legs so I'm going to put C for conclusion so when we want to find the converse we would switch the hypothesis and the converse or the conclusion around and that creates our converse okay so with this, when you switch the hypothesis and converse, you might not, or the conclusion, sorry, you might not necessarily get a true um, statement anymore. So if we do that with the example that we gave, if I switch, um, if an animal is a horse, then it has four legs. If I switch the hypothesis and the conclusion around, I end up with, if an animal has four legs, then it is a horse. Well, this is not always true, because if I use the case of something like a dog, okay, then a dog has four legs, but it's not a horse, which is what I have indicated right here. So this, the converse in this case would not be true. Now the nice thing with the Pythagorean theorem is that the converse of the Pythagorean theorem is always true. So the converse says, if a triangle has the sides A, B, and C, and A squared plus B squared equals C squared, then we know that we have a right triangle, okay? So the converse to this is true. And I'll throw um, here on the next slide, I'll show you what the original Pythagorean theorem said, just so you can see the difference. So here, the Pythagorean theorem said if any right triangle, or in any right triangle, the sum of the squares of the legs of the lengths is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. So we get a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, so here we have the converse that says, says if the triangle has side lengths a, b, and c, and a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then we know we have a right triangle. So my hypothesis up here, it says, um, in any right triangle, the sum of the squares of the legs is equal to the square. Then our conclusion is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So when we flip those around for a converse, we say if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then we know that we have a right triangle. Okay, so this is how we can use um, our side lengths to prove that we have a right triangle is by using the converse um, if we don't necessarily know that we have a right triangle. Please let me know if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I'll talk to you guys later and have a great day.